The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning this portion of the word that we note. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It states, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Right there we have the fact of Operation Z, actually the two power options. They were filled with God the Holy Spirit, plus Operation Z, which simply means the inculcation of Bible doctrine. The pastor, or in this case, the apostles, would teach the word. It would go into the soul, the frontal lobe, and it would be accepted as gnosis, that is G-N-O-S-I-S. That's academic knowledge. And from academic knowledge, they would take it, and God the Holy Spirit would uh, transfer it to epinosis, which means beyond knowledge, E P I. G-N-O-S-I-S, epinosis, beyond knowledge. And when that occurs, it becomes pneumatikos in the soul, or spiritual phenomena. Pneumatikos in the Greek means spiritual phenomena. So what they were doing, it, they were utilizing the two power options. They were utilizing the filling of God the Holy Spirit, plus Operation Z. Then it continues to the breaking of bread and to prayer. The breaking of bread had to do with the fact that they were utilizing the one ritual that is for the post-canon era, and that is the Eucharist. They would get, uh, utilize the Eucharist as part of a teaching tool, and also we still today use that, and also prayer as a function in the spiritual life. Though you are not spiritual because you pray, you pray because you are spiritual. You are not spiritual because you pray, you pray because you are spiritual. What does that mean? It means you must, when you pray, you must be filled with God the Holy Spirit, and that means there must not be sin in the life. That means you must have utilized 1 John 1, 9. If we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. And when we are filled with God the Holy Spirit and we pray, that is part of our Christian service. Then it continues. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. As I explained to you, this is pre-canon church age. Also, I explained to you that there must be a knowledge of dispensations and also a knowledge that the pastor must rightly divide the word of truth. Since there is no New Testament, there must be a credit card. That credit card is given to the apostles and they use it so that they are known as the ones who will be the writers of the New Testament and the ones who possess the New Testament doctrines. And that resides with Peter, James, John, Paul, and uh, the apostles. So everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. They were simply performing those signs so that people would know that they were in authority with regard to the Word of God. Then in verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common. Verse 45, 
they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Again, this is not related to any type of communism. This is related to the fact that at that time, if you were a Christian, you were an outlaw. And as an outlaw, you would have many legal fees as you went through the legal system, oftentimes flogged even for being a Christian. But to keep people out of trouble in those days, as there is today, bribery. Now, we might not see that much bribery in the United States, but if you were to go to Mexico, you can bribe your way out of anything. The same was true in Israel at the time, which was under the fourth cycle of discipline. You could bribe your way out of anything, so money talked. And so they could be uh, bought out of a whipping, so to say. And many people helped in that manner. So they sold their property and their possessions to give to anyone who had in need. And this shows that those in the early church in Acts 2.42, at least at this point, had grace orientation. And I'm not talking about the church at Jerusalem. I'm talking about those who listened to the true apostles. They had an enormous amount of grace orientation and they gave over an enormous amount of their own money, an enormous amount. But what we will study is it doesn't matter what the amount, it matters the motivation. So in quick review, let me go over some principles. Giving is an expression of worship to commemorate the grace policy of God. Principle number two, and I'm going quickly over these because if you want to know this in detail, just listen to the last message. Principle two, giving in the church age is the legitimate function of the believer's royal priesthood in worship. Both inside and outside the local church, you can give outside the local church, you can give in hospitality, etc. Giving is one of the four categories of Christian service. There is Christian service related to your spiritual gift. My spiritual gift, pastor, teacher, that's Christian service. Your spiritual gift may be administration. Your spiritual gift may have to do with giving or with helps or with some other aspect of the spiritual gifts, which we'll go over at some point uh, during our study. So Christian service related to your spiritual gift. Christian service related to your royal priesthood. Now what is your royal priesthood? You represent yourself before God. And what type of the spiritual uh, gifts would you use, not gifts, but what type of function in your Christian way of life would you use when it comes to your royal priesthood? You represent yourself before God, so that means you pray before God. Giving would be your royal priesthood. And the execution of the protocol plan of God, that means through learning, thinking, and solving. Solving through the ten problem-solving devices of the church age. What are those problem-solving devices? Do you remember? Rebound. The filling of God the Holy Spirit. The faith rest drill. Grace and doctrinal orientation. A personal sense of destiny. Personal love for God. Impersonal love for all mankind. Plus a sharing the happiness of God and occupation with the person of Christ. So we have Christian service related to your royal priesthood. Then you have Christian service related to your royal ambassadorship. Your royal ambassador means that you represent the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth. And that includes evangelism, which is the command for all of us. There's evangelism, witnessing, administration in the local church, depending on your gift. The function on the mission field, depending on your gift if you're a missionary. Function in any type of Christian service organization. Christian service... There's also Christian service related to, frankly, life. If you have a job, you're in Christian service. Every believer is in Christian service. They just simply must be filled with God the Holy Spirit. And then when they're filled with God the Holy Spirit, they're following the doctrinal mandates by which they can serve the Lord in whatever capacity. But some of those capacities include military service, law enforcement, government but this caveat, caveat means warning, but this caveat, C-A-V-E-A-T, Christian activism. Christian activism is not Christian service. 
And we're going to have, and since it's an election year, every election year there is Christian activism. And so, avoid it. Don't try to turn the world upside down by pushing a certain candidate. I've talked to people like this during this election season, and I've warned them. And uh, in some cases, they've taken the warning very seriously. It, it was actually a help, which was a shock to me. Most people become bilious, or they don't want to be told what to do. But in several cases... Uh, <coughs> There would be someone supporting a candidate so fiercely, and there's nothing wrong with supporting a candidate, nothing wrong with voting for that candidate, but if you're supporting that candidate more than you are Jesus Christ, there's something wrong, I'll tell you that. If you're going out talking about your candidate more than you are going out talking about Jesus Christ, there's something wrong. That candidate can't save you. That, that candidate can't save your soul. And yet there are so many people who get involved in uh, the politicking that they will say, follow this person, follow this person, and follow that person. But they don't say, follow Jesus Christ. They don't say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And that's the only hope for this country is for unbelievers to believe in Christ and for the believers to execute the protocol plan of God. That's it. That's the only hope for the country. No, politi no politician's going to help us. None. They're, they're all pretty much dumb anyway, as far as I see them. But I work on a... You might call me arrogant, but I don't care. I think on a higher plane than most people. I think on a higher plane than those politicians. I've heard all the politicians that are running speak and... Uh, I can uh, pretty much speak and do the same things they can. And, but you can't put your faith in that. What matters is your execution of the protocol plan of God. Now, I'll tell you one person who's a genius, but it doesn't make him a savior. It's Newt Gingrich. He's a genius. He's got the type of thinking I can understand and relate to. But, if he were the Republican nominee, you wouldn't hear much from me about it. Because it matters, your spiritual life. That's what's going to turn this country around, and that's an aside. Now, with the guy we have now, I won't say. Because of Ronald Reagan's 11th commandment. If you don't know it too bad, you've missed out on what I'm trying to say. But because of Ronald Reagan's 11th commandment, I'm not going to speak ill of who we have uh, decided to be our nominee as a Republican. But as a Democrat, you've decided for Barack Obama to be your nominee. Does it matter? You better not put all your faith and hope in him. So we have Christian service related to your spiritual gift. You have Christian service related to your ambassadorship, which includes evangelism, witnessing, administration in the local church, function in the mission field, function in any type of church service organization. There is Christian service related to the laws of divine establishment. You can function in military, in law enforcement, in government, but again, never in activism. You running around with a plaque for this candidate or that candidate or against some type of subject or you're going out and you're going to stop all abortions. You don't get involved in Christian activism, period. That doesn't change the world. You're trying to whitewash the devil's world. You're on Satan's team and you don't even know it and you don't even understand what I'm saying. Now, do you? Probably not. Giving is the presentation of money or other valuable commodities which may be used in sustaining the ministry of doctrinal communication. These gifts do not pertain to certain things like dog and pony shows or going toward the fact that, oh, give us money, we're going to build a gymnasium. Gymnasiums are for high school, not for church. Christian giving may be extended to organizations other than the local church, obviously. Missionary organization, Bible schools, radio, MP3, internet, 
giving is designed to support the communication gifts. That's a principle. Write it down. Giving is designed to support communication gifts. It doesn't matter which ones. You don't have to give to me. You can give to Moses on Wabiko. He is a missionary. That is a communication gift. Or you could give to Billy Graham. He's not doing much these days, but to any type of evangelistic organization. Rick Hughes. Rick Hughes needs money. You could give to Rick Hughes. He teaches to the young people. There's another guy who teaches to the young people, and his name has... Uh, I've, I've forgotten his name. Do you know? Gary Horton. Gary Horton teaches to the young people. He needs money. So you could give money to that organization. So motivation is the proper way to go about it. So turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 9.7. This is where we left off. 2 Corinthians 9.7. We were about to go to 2 Corinthians 9.8. Then we'll be on to new territory and I can slow down in my speaking. 2 Corinthians 9.7. Each person to the degree, the, the degree he has determined by means of his right lobe, so give, not from distress of mind or compulsion or emotions, for God loves a grace-oriented giver. God loves the grace-oriented giver who gives 50 cent. God loves the grace-oriented giver who gives $100. God does not, actually, God, in terms of an anthropopathism, God despises the millionaire who gives a million and wishes he hadn't. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each person, this is a corrected translation too, if you want to write it, each person, to the degree he has determined by means of his right lobe, so give, not from distress of mind or compulsion of emotions, for God loves a grace-oriented giver. Once again, each person, to the degree he has determined by means of his right lobe, so give, not from distress of mind or compulsion of emotions, for God loves a grace-oriented giver. In other words, you give based on the metabolized Bible doctrine in your soul, not on the basis of your emotions principle. You give based on the metabolized doctrine in your soul, not on the basis of emotion. Second principle, God provides and enjoys the mental attitude which accompanies giving. God loves grace-oriented giving. Don't give emotionally or impulsively. Determine for yourself what to give. Determine for yourself what to give. Don't ever give emotionally. Don't ever gamble emotionally. Don't ever do anything emotionally. Except cry. You can cry emotionally. Good emotion. But don't ever start giving away that home due to emotions. I, I, I heard a recent of a recent incident... Uh, that had occurred. There was this uh, couple in Australia, a man and a woman, married in Australia. And the man went to his doctor. He had had cancer in the past, but uh, it had went into remission. They'd fixed it all. But he, w but he had started having chest pain, so he went to his doctor. And his doctor told him, well, the cancer has come back. It's hit your heart. You have about a month to live. So, the husband and the wife went on a very lavish one-month vacation. They went to New Zealand. They went to other areas. And they just had a blast. And then he came back home after this, and they had uh, spent themselves. They were out of money now. Uh, the reason why the husband allowed them to go out of money was because he thought he'd be dead, and the life insurance would kick in, and his wife would have plenty to live on. But he didn't die. And he went to the doctor. And the doctor said, Sorry, we uh, mixed up your... Uh, well, we've misdiagnosed you. And you have 
uh, no cancer of the heart. And you're not going to die. In fact, you're quite healthy. And there he was stuck. And I bet he regretted all that money they spent. They even sold their house. So don't do things off of emotion. They did that emotionally. You know why they did it emotionally? He was going to die. So they figured, hey, let's, let's have a blast before you die. And then the husband figured, well, my wife will be set because I've got life insurance and I'll be dead. But he didn't die. Now they're stuck poor. Emotion. Bad decision. Do you know what you do if uh, you go to a doctor and they say you're about to die in a month? Do you know what you do? Nothing. You don't change your lifestyle. You might have to quit work if you start hurting, etc. I understand that. But outside of quitting work and just uh, lounging around, you don't do anything different. You should be simply prepared to go on that vacation to see the Lord. And it's a wonderful thing, actually. But you should uh, relax. Now, you can spend a bit more money than you usually would, but always do so thinking, thinking. These people in Australia, they weren't thinking. They blew everything. They blew everything to the point to where they went into debt. Now, he thought the life insurance would get him out of debt, but you've got to die to collect, and he's not going to, not yet anyway. So you see the point I'm making. Don't do things impulsively. Impulsive. I've known a lot of people in my life who were very impulsive with money. They wanted something right then, right there, and they had to get it right now. I've done it myself. Impulsiveness. But it's not right. And this is just common sense I'm giving you now. It's best not to be impulsive. Think about it first. Think. 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 Don't be impulsive. Think. And you may end up thinking, well, this is what I'm going to have to do anyway. It may have been your first thought, but think about it anyway. Don't be impulsive because you think it's going to make you happy for a second or two. And that's the way most people, not most, a lot of people, a lot of people run into problems when it comes to money because they are so impulsive. Well, 2 Corinthians 9, 8 is where we left off. And this is where we begin. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Now, this is the corrected translation. God's grace is sufficient for you is not there. It is there in a way, but that's not the correct translation. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, that always having, always having, all sufficiency in everything. What is that? That's part of logistical grace support. You're always going to have what you need. You're not always going to have what you want, but you're always going to have what you need, whether you know it or not. That always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Well, let's get some principles from 2 Corinthians 9, 8. Principle 1. God graciously provides extra finances for grace givers to give. Principle number one. God graciously provides extra finances for grace givers to give. I know my gift is not giving, so I don't have crap. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of money. <laughs> oh, I can give of some of my services. Or I could go out on the street and do some uh, community service or something. <laughs> but I'm telling you. All right, well, here we go. God, in principle one, 
God graciously provides extra finances for grace givers to give. And that's not true. I do have the ability to give every now and then. I could probably take somebody out to eat or something on occasion. And that's about it. So principle one, God graciously provides extra finances for grace givers to give. Principle number two, the only legitimate system of giving is a grace giver giving to a grace cause. I'll repeat this two more times. The only legitimate system of giving is a grace giver giving to a grace cause. The only legitimate system of giving is a grace giver giving to a grace cause. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 9 9. And by the way, 2 Corinthians 9 9 goes along with Psalms 112 9. The quotation 2 Corinthians 9 9. Just as it stands written, He scatters abroad, He gave it to the poor, His righteousness abides forever. What's this mean? I'll read it again, but what's it mean? Just as it stands written, and just as it stands written is a reference to Psalms 112.9. He scatters abroad. He gave it to the poor. His righteousness abides forever. Well, what's it mean? Principle one. Principle number one. He scatters abroad. He scatters abroad means that God gives money to certain people, both rich and poor. He scatters abroad means that God gives money to certain people, both rich and poor. I've noticed that all my life. I've noticed that there have been rich people that they just keep getting richer and richer. I've noticed poor people, they'll always be poor. I've noticed poor people who deserve... Well, I can't say that. That's a bit uh, not gracious. But I've known poor people who would never understand how to be rich because they spend their money so fast they'll never be rich. But he scatters abroad means that God gives money to certain people, both rich and poor. I've known some people who are so impulsive with money that they really have a serious problem. They will never... If they were, if they, I mean, I'm serious. If these type people had, if suddenly fell in their, if if suddenly in their bank account fell ten million dollars, give them five years and they'll be living in a trailer park. I'm serious. I know people like that. I'm sure you might know them too. They just don't know how to handle money, and they never will. There's one of their things. And that goes along with people not being equal. None of us are equal. We each have our own idiosyncrasies. And uh, some people are going to be impulsive with money no matter what. That's just the way they are. There's no, you can't teach them. You can't do anything. That's just them. So he scatters abroad, means that God, but God knows. So God is gracious and God knows. So that uh, we all make it anyway, don't we? He's, once again, principle, he scatters abroad means that God gives money to certain people, both rich and poor. Principle two, God's grace, righteousness meets at the point of grace giving. Principle number two, God's grace, righteousness meets at the point of grace giving. So now let's look at 2 Corinthians 9.10. 2 Corinthians 9.10. Now he who supplies seed to the sower. What's that? Capital. What's it really saying is, Now he who supplies capital. And there's capital over workers, or at least there should be. Now he who supplies seed to the sower capital and bread for food he will supply and multiply your seed for sowing 
and increase the harvest of your righteousness. What does this mean? This verse means that God supplies and gives extra money to grace givers. God supplies and, and God multiplies money, extra money, to grace givers. I guess one of the most wonderful gifts to have is the gift of giving. And if you're in fellowship and utilizing it, you're going to get a lot of money. You ever wondered why somebody gets a lot of money or somebody just gets a good job to where they're able to provide and able to uh, not just provide, but able to spread their money around to others who are in need? That's part of their spiritual gift. Grace giving, and it's also part of what God does. God supplies. Again, principle. God supplies and gives extra money to grace givers. As a result, there is an increase in the harvest of your Christian service. That's for the one with that spiritual gift. There's an increase of supply of well, when you use it properly and with right motivation, you can always use it with wrong motivation. But when you use it with right motivation, it means increase in Christian service in your Christian harvest. Now let's look at 2 Corinthians 9, 11 through 12. 2 Corinthians 9, 11 through 12. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanksgivings to God. What's this mean? It means that giving is a mental attitude based upon the problem-solving device called grace orientation. Grace orientation is the basis for grace giving. If you don't have grace orientation, you're a prude. A legalistic prude. Now, notice I didn't say if you don't give money. I said if you don't have grace orientation, you're a legalistic prude. But again, principle. Giving is a mental attitude based upon the problem-solving device called grace orientation. Giving is a mental attitude based upon the problem-solving device called grace orientation. Grace orientation is the basis for grace giving. Let me see how much time we have left here. Waiting to see a clock. Well, we'd be way short if we stopped, so let's go. Let's look at some of the doctrinal principles of giving. The doctrinal principles of giving. Principle 1. Giving is an expression of the royal family honor code. Principle 1. Giving is an expression of the royal family honor code. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 16 verse 26. Romans 16:26. Again, the doctrinal principles of giving. Giving is an expression of the royal family honor code. Now in Romans chapter 16, verse 26. For Macedonia and Achaia have decided with pleasure to make a special offering to the poor believers who are in Jerusalem. Paul was very concerned about the poor believers in Jerusalem. 
and they were very poor because they had already they were under the third cycle of discipline and actually the fourth cycle of discipline so there were many poor in Jerusalem and in Romans 16:26 the apostle Paul gives uh, accolades to certain areas of Christians who've given money to the poor believers for Macedonia and Achaia have decided with pleasure to make a special offering to the poor believers who are in Jerusalem. And then we have in Galatians 2.10. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2, verse 10. Galatians chapter 2, verse 10. Still dealing with giving. The doctrine of giving. One thing I want you to notice about giving is that it has nothing to do with socialism. Nothing. Socialism forces people to give money. God never does. Socialism through taxation forces people to give money. God's system is charity, which is no forcing. It allows people freedom to give if they want to. And that's the best system there ever is because it's God's system. And any type of system of socialism is evil and wrongdoing. And it's the reason why this country groans today under the third and fourth cycle of discipline. We're in trouble. I won't even go into detail, otherwise I'll become a holy roller. Giving is an expression of the Royal Family Honor Code, Romans or now in Galatians 2.10, they only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. So principle, charity is from God. Principle, charity is from God. Socialism and welfare are from man. And anything from man is inferior and evil. Charity is from God. Mr. President, charity is from God, and you're not God. Charity is from God. Socialism and welfare are from man. Mere man. And Mr. President, you're a mere man. I better calm down or I'll have to rebound. Giving is an expression of free will without gimmicks, without coercion. Let's flip back to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 8.3 2 Corinthians 8.3 And for those of you listening on the internet, it could be, you could be listening to this in January of 2020. We'll have a new president by then, so I might not even be shouting at that president. <laughs> I've noticed that in listening to my colonel from years past. He would start shouting about a certain president and well, I was living under Reagan. What's this president? This, this president's a totally different bird. So we can't go by politics. But there are an awful lot of examples, I can tell you that. So where were we? 2 Corinthians 8.3 I testify on the basis of their ability, and beyond their ability they gave willingly. Now, their giving was a sign of their spiritual growth. This is in 2 Corinthians 8, 3. I testify on the basis of their ability, and beyond their ability, they gave willingly. And this simply means that their giving was a sign of their spiritual growth. For giving is an expression of mental attitude in every circumstance of life. That's found in 2 Corinthians 8, 2, which states that in the midst of severe testing and great pressure, the superabundance of their happiness and their deep poverty overflowed in rich 
generosity. So even though they were under adversity, they shared the happiness of God. And since they had that great mental attitude, they gave even while they were in deep poverty. That's what it says. They gave even while they were in deep poverty. Giving must, must express an attitude toward the Lord before it can express an attitude toward others. Principle. Giving must express an attitude toward the Lord before it can express an attitude toward others. 2 Corinthians 8.5 2 Corinthians 8, 5 states, And not even as we anticipated, but they gave first of themselves to the Lord. You give first of yourself to the Lord through your positive volition, through the utilization of the two power options, through coming to understand the ten problem-solving devices. They expressed it to the Lord, first of all. And not even as we anticipated, but they gave first of themselves to the Lord. Then they gave to us by the will of God. So what happened was these believers were occupied with Christ. They had a personal love for God the Father. And they were rightly motivated in their giving. If you ever grudgingly give, you're not... You just wasted whatever you gave. You should grudge it. Giving depends on the consistent post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. 2 Corinthians 8.7 puts it this way, But just as you excel in everything in faith rest, and in doctrine, and in knowledge, and in all diligence, and in love from you to us, you also excel in this grace giving. So this is giving associated with impersonal love and not with personal love. Giving can be done and must be done in impersonal love, in this case, not personal love. When you give with impersonal love, that is grace giving. Precedence for giving is derived from the dispensation of the hypostatic union and is predicated on grace. Anything from the hypostatic union is predicated on grace. That's why 2 Corinthians 8 9 states, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, how is he rich? as eternal God, the richest person ever. Yet for your sake he became poor, true humanity, so that you through his poverty, when he was judged for all the sins of all of human history, might become rich. So giving is a mental attitude related to an overt act. 2 Corinthians 8.12 For if the willingness is there... The gift is acceptable on the basis of what one has, not on the basis of what one does not have. The principle is motivation. Willingness counts for giving, even if you have nothing to give. Sometimes you're willing to give, you have nothing to give, but it counts. There have been many times I've been willing to want to help out, but I just could not in any way, shape, or form. But it still counts because I wanted to. Motivation! Motivation is the key. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us as to what it means to have that grace orientation related to giving. We ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.